Okay, uh, I'm going to kick this off tonight. It's my very great pleasure to welcome two historians tonight uh, for a split session of the Radical History School. We're going to start uh, with Mary Louise Roberts from uh, Madison in Wisconsin, who's going to talk to us about the Leroy Henry case and, and Shepton Mallet and Bath. And then we're uh, going to have questions with her because she's got to shoot off to another meeting. So we're very grateful to her for giving up our, her time uh, to us. Uh, there's people from Tavistock joined us now. And then when we finish that session at about 7.25, we're moving to Kate. And Kate's prepared a, a video presentation for us, uh, for us. And we're going to be watching that first. And then we'll be asking Kate questions. So I'll introduce Kate later. But it's my very great pleasure to introduce uh, Mary Louise Roberts to you all the way from America. Mary, over to you. Louise, over to you. Sorry. Okay. Thank you so much for inviting me, uh, Les. It's a real privilege to be here. And I apologize for having to run off. I initially thought the session would be at noon, not at one. Uh, so that was the issue. So I'm just going to talk a few minutes here about the Leroy Henry case. Uh, and uh, before it was resolved, uh, the Leroy Henry case became an international cause slip. Uh, and um, so I'm going to tell you about the case, and then I'm going to just explain why I think it was so important, because I think it was extremely important both for Americans and the British. So the case uh, begins on the night of May 5th, 1944, so about a month before D-Day. Um, and uh, a couple in Bath were awoken by pebbles on their window and they looked down and saw a 38 year old uh, GI, a black GI who was a truck driver from St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, and he claimed to them once they opened up the window uh, that he was lost. Um, so the wife went down, her name is Irene Maud Lilly uh, and she, uh, she asked what she could do. And the man said he, he wanted directions back to the ba base. Uh, and uh, so off the two went, she said she'd walk him down the road. Uh, off the two went into the night, the husband stayed behind. Uh, and when she didn't come back for about a half an hour, the husband went out looking for her and she was in a field and she claimed to have been raped by Leroy Henry. Um, so uh, her husband takes her to the police and on the way they saw uh, Leroy Henry and she could not identify his face. She never was able to do that, uh, but she said his gait was familiar. So he was arrested um, and uh, tried by the United States court martial uh, and condemned to death in three weeks. That was how quickly it all happened. Uh, and ultimately, uh, it caused so much controversy in England uh, that uh, Eisenhower literally had to pay attention to the case on June 2nd, three days before D-Day, four days before D-Day, uh, and uh, finally uh, acquitted Henry uh, for reasons I'll explain. Now, the immediate context of this story is that there are a lot of African Americans in uh, the UK prior to D-Day. Uh, it was uh, described uh, by the British, one British official as a necessary evil uh, because the Americans needed to have a lot of infrastructure built, including airstrips and things like that. And they wanted to bring in uh, the part of the army that always got the crummy jobs who were not allowed to fight in combat and who did service occupations. And that was African-Americans. Now, Leroy Henry's rapid uh, um, trial and his threatened execution in this case was not at all unusual in the European theater. And I've spent a lot of time uh, doing the French case mostly. And as I was doing the French case in my book, What Soldiers Do, I discovered this trial as well. Uh, there were 29 executions of African-American men in the European theater. So this was not an isolated incident. And the vast majority of those had almost no trial. Uh, they were uh, not really represented by uh, adequate or objective counsel, uh, and they were hung by rope. Uh, that's how they were executed in France. 
So the Leroy Henry case was really interesting to me because it became so famous. Um, and so after I finished my book on the French, I circled back and, and looked at him. We don't know very much about him other than he was a truck driver and he was from Missouri. Um, so uh, generally there was uh, you know, a segregated army. The United States was a segregated racist society that had um, an army that mirrored that. Uh, and African-Americans not only were not allowed to fight, but they were also uh, given almost no promotions. They had almost no chance of promotions. There were very, very few uh, black officers uh, and they faced discrimination uh, in every aspect of their army lives, uh, including you know, where they could go um, in the cities, surrounding bases, uh, what places they could go in. I mean, we had a very segregated society in the 1940s. Um, and this caused a lot of problems with the British, which I'll talk about now. For one thing, the British uh, in the area around Bath, but in general, it didn't really understand the rules of American segregation. Uh, and so there are many incidences in pubs where uh, white GIs would say, don't serve this person. And the pub owner would say, well, why not and serve them? Uh, there are a lot, of, um, uh, a lot of fights around women. If an African-American was going with a British woman or dancing with a British woman, oftentimes a fight would start, which was almost always initiated by white soldiers. So, um, and in general, I, uh, you know, there was a, a mass observation survey uh, in during the occupation and the British uh, really by a large majority, 75% disapproved of um, the segregation and the racism that they had seen from the uh, American army. Uh, and many of them liked the uh, African American GIs better than the white GIs because they weren't complaining all the time about British plumbing and British appliances and so on and so forth. And they were also, uh, you know, this is highly speculative, but they were also considered much better dancers than the white GIs. Um, so uh, uh, the British view of Leroy Henry was outrage. Um, they, uh, there was a petition in Bath uh, and uh, that grew to a national petition with literally tens of thousands of signatures. Um, and the important thing to remember here is that unlike the French, where there was not that kind of response or resistance, uh, the British had a free press uh, during the war. So um, uh, there was uh, a lot of petitions and outrage that was spread by the British press at that time. Um, the British tended to see uh, the whole situation differently. Uh, first of all, they thought that Maud Allen, the wife who claimed to be raped, uh, was, and I quote, one prominent Bath citizen. The woman is a well-known bad lot. The woman is a bad known bad, bad lot. And, you know, in general, their view was, and I, I, I agree with them, is that uh, Leroy Henry claimed to have had sex before with Maud Lilly. Uh, and this was common um, even for people who were married to make money uh, uh, servicing uh, uh, Afri African-American and in general American soldiers with and sometimes their husband's consent. Um, and so uh, he, you know, Leroy Henry said in his defense that he had seen her before, had sex with her before. Uh, when he, uh, he ha she had invited him to the house that night, he used the uh, being lost as an excuse to get her away from her husband. Uh, and then she demanded more money uh, than she had before. And this is again, really common uh, among French prostitutes as well as British prostitutes to ask American GIs for black GIs for more money. And then to threaten as she did that if they didn't get more money, uh, they would then um, get them in trouble. They would say, you know, he raped me. Um, so basically African-American GIs were being extorted. Uh, and this is uh, mm -hmm. what Leroy Henry claimed happened and, and what many Bath residents also thought had happened. 
given that that um, Maud uh, had a very bad reputation. So these are some of the vulnerabilities of black men uh, in, in England. Um, and uh, you know, it was a risk for them to have sex at all because the common feeling in the American army is that no white woman would have sex with a black man uh, unless uh, she was coerced to do so. So any interracial sex in this case was rape by definition. Um, so uh, you have for the British, uh, an enormous uh, disdain for segregation. Um, and I think that was in part also a response to the sort of takeover of the country by the Americans. Um, and uh, in man many of the papers, uh, the British called the Americans colonists. They're come to colonize us. Uh, and with their terrible laws. And this would never happen in England. And I, I think also what the Leroy Henry case provided was an opportunity for many British people to complain about uh, feeling overwhelmed about the American occupation and uh, all, the, uh, all the Americans that were taking over, you know, requisitioning huge amounts of property. Okay, so uh, one, uh, British called uh, the whole Jim Crow system, as we call it in the United States, which is the system of segregation and racism in the South in particular, a color problem peculiar to itself. In other words, the United States has a, is, has a unique racial problem. Now, this was really important uh, that they were spreading this notion because what the Americans realized in this moment, 1944, was that the uh, future was bright, that the Americans were beginning to be a, a global power. That was pretty clear. Um, and it was about to become a superpower uh, in its control or its hegemony over Europe. And what they also realized is that uh, you know, in this new position, in this new framework, there was a new glare of light on their own institutions, particularly an institution like Jim Crow, which was completely inverse to democratic ideals, uh, chief among them, obviously, equality. Um, and so uh, this was a moment when the Americans had to sort of look at themselves and think, geez, you know, we're either going to have to keep secret about this Jim Crow thing, or we're going to have to um, eliminate it. So it's a key geopolitical moment for the United States. And it's also a key geopolitical moment for the British, um, you know, because they're at a very weak spot uh, in 1944. Uh, Churchill knew that without the, the United States, he would not be able to win the war. He might be able to keep Britain from being conquered, but he could not uh, uh, reduce the Nazi threat. Uh, and this also um, was uh, a, a kind of key moment in the British Commonwealth, which was like Jim Crow in that it was a system of racial hierarchies. Um, and that imperial control over the emperor was weakening. Uh, and um, it threatened their own global status. And, and sure enough, after the war, Britain loses a great part of its empire through nationalist movements, uh, most notably at this point in India. So um, it's somewhat ironic for the British, I think, uh, to have, have criticized the Americans for a racial uh, and racist system. Uh, and in fact, members of the British Commonwealth also had a, a great deal of difficulty when they came to metropolitan England during the war. Uh, for example, the British West Indians who came to the UK to serve uh, couldn't find housing. They experienced housing discrimination. Um, and the South African army was also segregated at this time. Uh, and in the summer of 40, sorry, in 42, 43, uh, Churchill puts down quite um, brutally a nationalist revolt in India. Uh, and then there is, of course, the Bengal famine. Uh, 
So, um, so there's, a, there's a kind of double irony here. One is each is criticizing the other for their racial hierarchy when they have one themselves. But also, secondly, and most importantly, both nations at this point are fighting two regimes, Japan and, and Germany, which are basically uh, racial states based on racial hierarchies. And so African Americans are really in the United States, uh, the NWACP were very quick to point this out. Uh, they had what was called a double V campaign. Uh, and the double V campaign meant that we're, we're going to eliminate racism in Germany and Japan, but we're also going to eliminate racism at home. Uh, so again, uh, a moment in the United States when they begin to realize under the glare of global, um, a global uh, you know, visibility uh, that there are levels of hypocrisy here um, as well uh, with Britain. So um, the Henry case uh, brings entanglements between Jim Crow and British colonialism, um, the double V campaign and Indian nationalism. Churchill is quiet about Leroy Henry. Uh, and I think uh, it was simply that he needed the United States so much to save, uh, save the British um, and he couldn't risk alienating Americans. Uh, what happened was that the British upheaval at the populist level uh, forced a rereading of the case. Uh, and when that was affirmed, uh, once again, uh, it was Eisenhower himself who um, demanded a second rereading. And that was then, uh, uh, you know, resulted in a turnover. I don't know anything about Leroy Henry after this happened. Um, you know, I imagine he went back to his unit and drove a truck for the rest of the war. Um, I have tried to find something about him. I read his um, court martial case, uh, but that doesn't tell anything about what happens when someone is freed. So that's a gap in my story. Um, but I think it's a story that's important for a number of reasons, as I've said. One, the tensions of occupation uh, in 44-45, um, the importance of sex and sexuality in race relations uh, uh, in general, um, and also, you know, this moment, this really fragile but important geopolitical moment for both the United States and Britain, with the United States beginning to achieve global power and um, the UK uh, beginning to decline. So that's all I have to say. Uh, I have about five minutes. If anybody has yeah, questions. Thank you. Thank you, Lou. We'll encourage people to put questions into the question answer box. I've got a couple for you. So you said there are 29 executions of African Americans in Europe. How many of those were in the UK? Do we know? No, I don't know offhand. I'd have to look that up. Yeah. yeah. So there were, there were no, more no, in no. France. And, and the, the figure 29 was executed, the number of GIs that were executed. Yeah. Okay, that, that's not the number of. So that, that includes both Britain and France, uh, the African Americans who were unlikely Roy Henry convicted and it was not resolved, and then they went to their death. Yeah. Um, and, and the second question is we, we, you talked very uh, uh, fluently, I thought, about Jim Crow and segregation, and Kate will be coming on to that because what Kate's book about is really about uh, segregation in the American armed forces. Uh, but actually, although we're, we're saying this is a key geopolitical movement, Jim Crow didn't end for a number of years uh, after the Second World War, did it? No, no. One could argue that it's still here. Um, so, uh, but uh, the most recent literature is really now seeing um, the civil rights movement as beginning in the Second World War. This is really the moment because you know, these uh, black men come home in 45, 46, and they get the same treatment as they did before. Um, and then the other thing is that the war uh, caused enormous migration to uh, the West and the North, um, where there were armament factories and other kinds of war industry factories. And that migration itself 
of um, African Americans out of the South had a radicalizing effect on them. So, so people are now seeing that the, the real roots of the civil rights movement are in, in the war. Um, because the other thing that happens is the, the NAACP, which is the main sort of uh, pro-African American organization in the United States, comes over. Uh, Walter White's the president. And he goes to, you know, he spends time in London, and then he goes to Algeria. And he begins to realize that um, the kinds of racial injustices in the Jim Crow system are not that different from the kinds of racial injustices in the French empire. So this is a moment where people are on the move a lot. Um, and people are beginning to realize, oh, you know, race racism is a global system. And, you know, what's going on in the Jim Crow South is also going on in Northern Africa, uh, which is also going on in India. So for um, racial others, it's a huge moment of recognition that this is a global system and they're part of that, but, you know, more similar than distinct. So uh, Jacqueline wants to know, uh, do we know what happened to Maud, his accuser? What was it? The... Uh, what happened to his accuser, Maud? Uh, what happened to the woman oh, in the case? Oh, yeah, good question. I think uh, nothing happened to her. She just went back to her life. Um, I don't I don't know if you know she got divorced or what, but yeah, no, I mean she wasn't uh, she wasn't charged with anything. And then Michael's coming with, am I right in saying black GIs fighting on the front in World War One, but not so much in World War Two? What was the reason and the implications for that? So were were black GIs not fighting on the front so much in World War Two? Uh, no, they weren't, except for um, two exceptions when the U.S. Army got desperate. One was in northern Italy, um, the 92nd fought there, and then also in Belgium during the winter Battle of Bastogne, they brought in some black troops there. Uh, but I, to my knowledge, black troops did not fight that, that much in the First World War either. Um, so there were exceptions, but the general rule was the same, that they did service. Kate, do you have any questions? Oh gosh, I've got so many questions. Um, <laughs> I thought you might. I know. <laughs> I know. Go in a minute. I know. Go go. In a minute. I know. I might have to continue with this. I thought it was brilliant. It's so interesting, and the whole movement of you were saying people moving around and finding the similarities. And actually, right. with the Nazi race laws, there was a there was you know a similarity right. with the Nazi race laws and Jim Crow. Um, right. There's right. a book. There's a book I've read saying that they looked towards the American law system. Oh, absolutely, absolutely To, to, to true. frame how they treated the Jewish people. Yeah. So it's a, I, I find at the moment it's a very exciting time because we're looking at history. We're certainly looking at aspects of history with like the shades have fallen away, the scales right. have fallen from our eyes and we're looking at it in a full way. And yeah. Yeah. The, the way that you framed that as being a moment for Britain and America and the world, actually, it's just really interesting. And I just I welcome more research and more stories like this that can that can follow the narrative, because it's so important that we understand what it was really like, you know, yeah, back then. No, and, and for me, yeah. what I find so interesting is the British reaction, because I just presumed we would have been inhospitable, to be honest, to the African American. Yeah, it's um, very interesting, isn't it? That was my presumption. Um, so when I, I I researched the story of what happened in my dad's hometown in Launceston, where where Les is from, um, and I was amazed actually. I didn't realise because I feel that people have forgotten about it, and a lot of the old people I've spoken to remember it, but it was written out of history. This this part was just written out, and oh, yeah. Yeah. and I welcome yeah. anyone bringing it back. Yeah, yeah okay, so just come. one more anecdote before I leave. Uh, please, first of all, I please. think that we, as long as we have national histories, we don't have these stories. Like you yes. have to think transnationally. Yes. yes. But, but the most interesting thing to me was there was a very important um, soccer star, British soccer star, who was, I, I can't remember, he was from Africa someplace. And he came into a London hotel, a very nice London hotel, to uh, get a room. Uh, he was doing something in London, I can't remember. And they wouldn't give him a room because there were white GIs in the hotel who said uh, they would not 
same hotel. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I just find that mind blowing. Wow. You know, oh, yeah. that's just yeah. mind blowing. Yeah. 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 All right. It's I have to go. Unfortunately, Kate, I'll listen to you and please be in touch. If anyone has any further questions, yeah. It's Mary yeah. Roberts, which is my first and last name at WISC. W I S C Wisconsin. Dot edu. I, I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much for the opportunity, Wes. And Kate, Lou, I'll be thank you back. very much. It was brilliant, okay. absolutely brilliant. Okay. Thank you. Thank bye you bye. very much. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. Wow, that was a great start, wasn't it? And, and we're going to touch again on a lot of those issues with with Kate's work. Um, and just to give you an idea, um, I was studying. Um, photographs of soldiers in American soldiers in, who were stationed in Lawson in the Second World War and there were two there were two camps in Lawson a black camp and a white camp and on all of the major uh, parades in Lawson uh, Victory in Europe Day Victory in Japan Day all of those parades, there's not a black face to be seen in any of the pictures in the newspapers or in the uh, the official prints of those parades and yet we had hundreds, if not thousands of black soldiers in this region. So that just gives you an idea about the way in which the American army and the press were controlling uh, what went out uh, via the mass media. Okay, we'll come back to that. I'm sure we'll come back to that. Um, and I know now uh, we're going to move to your video. Hello, my name's Kate, and I'm here to talk about an American uprising in Second World War England, mutiny in the duchy. I'd like to start by setting the scene. It's a cool evening in September 1943, and the streets are still wet from rain earlier that night. Suddenly, around 9.30, there's a sound of marching footsteps. And the sound of those footsteps hitting the street is something witnesses remember to this day. They say it was as if an entire company of men was moving through the night. They were armed with rifles, ammo and bayonets, and they were marching in formation. And yet, after a mile or so, they stopped when they reached the town square, where they found another group of soldiers and some army vehicles. A few words were uttered, and that's all it took for an almighty firefight to be sparked, which left shop windows, buildings, people, vehicles broken, but not destroyed. This was an extraordinary display of firepower. But for me, the most interesting thing was that it wasn't happening in occupied, war-torn, Europe, but on the home front in Britain, specifically the quaint Norman town of Launceston in Cornwall. The second interesting fact about this was it was a display made by African American soldiers who were making a stand against the white soldiers who policed them. I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I found out about this story, how I went about researching it, and what it says about the real special relationship in 1943. Because make no mistake about it, this was a story the authorities wanted quietened down. They want it hushed up, there was a cover up. Why? Well, I'm gonna have a go explaining that for you a little bit later. So firstly, how did I find out about this story? I feel I've always known about it. I've grown up with my dad's stories from the war. They're a Cornish family in London. They were moved um, during the war. And so he's got fantastic stories about the Blitz, about rationing, about shrapnel. And one of his best stories is about the time when a German pilot parachuted into his garden after losing a dogfight and his mum made him a cup of tea while the local Bobby came to arrest him. So the Second World War was very close to our hearts as we were growing up. We loved hearing my dad's story and we were interested in history. And that kind of came together um, on our annual trips to Cornwall, where we'd go down, stay in Launceston and visit various uncles, aunts, cousins. And I remember very vividly one summer afternoon in the 1980s where we'd been to see Charles Causley, the renowned poet who happened to be my dad's teacher at school. And um, we went down to the town square and in the town square, we looked at the hotel, the White Hart Hotel, lovely 17th century institution. And around the doorway, there were bullet holes. And there were also bullet holes in the town's war memorial, which is just opposite. And I was hooked. I was so fascinated by this story and this shootout that happened where we went on holiday every year. So my interest in this story has been there for a very long time. 
Fast forward a few years, um, I'm a trained journalist. I've spent 10 years producing historical documentaries for TV um, and I've covered subjects such as the abdication, the Second World War, Live Aid and the Miners' Strike. So I've got a, a raft of tools that I would approach this subject with. And I kind of determined this is my time to do it. I want to find out what really happened. So I put in a very lucky freedom of information request to the clerk of the court. And after much cajoling and after about a year, I had this huge package about that thick that arrived on my doorstep. And I was lucky enough to have a transcript of the court martial that followed the shooting I've just described to you and an accompanying file with all the other papers that related to it. So I was very lucky. It was brilliant news. The other brilliant bit of news I had a week later was I had uh, my first baby. So I thought, I can't deal with this manuscript yet. I put it under my bed. I'll get it out when I've got time. So three children later, quite a few years later, my youngest started primary school and I got the file out from under my bed and I resolved to really tackle it. Um, so I started my research. There's a lot of, quite a lot of literature about this. There's a brilliant book by the brilliant Graham Smith who has written about this, this the event of when African-Americans came to try, train and trial for D-Day in this country. Um, so secondary, mater secondary reading material. And then I really wanted to have a look at the primary sources, which is something I do for my television documentaries. So I spent time in the National Archives in Kew um, in America. I've got a great researcher who went in and got the, the reports I wanted out, uh, the Imperial War Museum and the British Library, where I was lucky enough to read newspaper reports from the time that weren't perhaps so accessible, and things like mass observation and the papers of the NAACP. So these were the tools I used to research this story. And wow, what a story it was when I really started scratching at the surface. So the very first thing I discovered was that the American army that came to this country to trial and train for D-Day, as I've said, was segregated along the lines in which the American South was separated by race. It was called Jim Crow and it was meant to be separate but equal. So it meant that everything from transport, education, restaurants, churches, even if you just let me show you a picture, things like drinking fountains were separated alongside your race. So you can see this says we cater to white trade only and this is a a guy having a drink at a water fountain that he's allowed to drink from because of the colour of his skin. So it was a, a quite serious segregation and it was this segregation that the US Army sought to replicate when it was preparing for combat in the Second World War. So it meant that if you were called up to the US Army, the first thing you'd find out is that you were generally going to be joining the supply side of thing, the service of supply. So it meant the dirty, dangerous, hard jobs, including quartermaster, transport, engineering. That was the kind of work they'd be doing. And in fact, my guys from Launceston, they were an ordnance ammunition company and they were responsible for building ammunition dumps um, in the West Country to supply the troops going to D-Day. So that was the first thing they found. They were separate, the jobs they had were worse, and then they were sent to training camps. And at Washington, the trains became segregated and then you change car and go down to your training camp, invariably in the south of the country. And the very best that they found accompanied this segregation was verbal abuse. And at the worst point, it was, you know, physical abuse. Um, so just to show you on my, my title page, my jacket, um, you can see just some groups. They're actually in Bodmin camp in Cornwall and they're watching a display by Joe Louis. But if you can see that, that very rigid line here of separation by race, you've got the black troops behind and the white troops in front. This is what the US Army was like. And this is certainly what the troops that made a stand in Launceston had encountered. So this was the segregated army and the troops in Launceston, the 581st Ordnance Ammunition Company, they certainly had a very rough time in their training. And we know that because none other than Walter White, who was secretary of the NAACP, the foremost civil rights campaign group at the time, came to investigate. I'll just show you a quick picture of Walter White. There we go. He's 
this chap here. So he came to investigate after the, the shooting, the stories from the soldiers. And he found that the training camp where they had been training in Oklahoma, Oklahoma excuse me, it was Fort Sill. Um, he found that the soldiers there quickly found that the US Army uniform offered no immunity to insult. It meant they were given very little time for R&R. &R. When they were given R&R, &R, they weren't allowed off the base and into the town. If they were allowed off the base, they weren't given transport. If they did get on the transport, they weren't allowed to go into the town's restaurants and bars. It was a very difficult time for them. There was a lot of um, problems. They found a lot of problems. They were restricted to camp. They were punished a lot. So that was their experience of training. And we know that when they went to the second camp, which was Camp Patrick Henry in Virginia, it's kind of like a staging um, place for people about to go overseas and they did last minute bits of training. Again, they were segregated. Again, they were restricted to camp. They weren't allowed out. And there is evidence that they began to amass secretly ammunition. Why? Because they felt they're under attack. Um, and this was happening in training camps up and down the country. So this is the background to the 581st Ordnance Ammunition Company's mutiny, their uprising. The second part was what was happening in America at the time. 1943 has subsequently been dubbed the long, hot, bloody summer because of the racial tension that well, you could see in the army. Was, was in society too. And there were riots which spread coast to coast. It started in LA, it ended in New York. The worst one was in Detroit, where 34 people died, 25 of whom were black, 17 of whom were shot by police. So this is the background to what was going on in America. And it was inevitable that this tension would come over in the troop ships that were coming in wave after wave across the ocean over here to Britain. This tension was very great indeed. Let me show you just a picture quickly from Detroit, just to give you a sense of what was going on. You can see here, this guy's been run down by a group of white citizens. So this was the, it was a very febrile, dangerous time to be an African-American and in the army that offered you, as Walter White said, no protection. So what happened next? Britain, when they came to Britain, Britain itself um, had an empire upon which the sun never set. But surprisingly, there were very few people of colour living in the UK at the time. The black British population is supposed to be about 15,000 and they were generally centred on the port cities of Cardiff, Liverpool and London. Um, in such a monochrome country, racism was bound to exist. There were race riots here in 1919. And Leary Constantine, I'll just get a picture so you can see him, um, was a West Indian cricketer who came to live in this country in the 1920s and played cricket. I'll just show you. Can you see that? He's here. There's Leary Constantine there. Um, and he said that um, personal slights were an unpleasant part of life in Britain for anyone of his colour. So that was what it was like. It wasn't a very nice place to be, I don't think. So what happened when black soldiers who were having a terrible time in the army came over to this country? And this, for me, was the third really surprising fact about this whole story. Knowing the kind of reception that those who travelled on the Windrush just five years later had in this country. The surprising thing is that most ordinary British people had huge empathy for the African-American soldiers and a real intolerance for the colour bar and segregation that came over with the US Army. So in effect, what it meant was that when army units came, they would separate the troops and they would say, these bars are for the white soldiers, these are for the black, or they'd have towns that are open to all the soldiers, but on different nights. So Black Tuesdays, White Wednesdays, and so on. And the British really didn't like this segregation. And we know this from evidence that I've seen in the archives, and it can be quite low level. Um, they didn't like the separation. They didn't like the fact that they weren't meant to serve them in bars or shops. And they certainly reacted to the very violent and over the top sort of policing by the white MPs. And they could see it. 
Um, and we see this in evidence from mass observation, you know, prototype polling, social sort of um, organisation. We can see in the diaries, in the reports, in the polls that they took. People didn't like it. In letters that were censored, British civilians, British servicemen, their censored letters, American service letters. Um, you, can, you can see the tension and the British distrust and dislike of the colour bar. It's in newspaper articles. Um, it was raised in Parliament. It was in opinion pieces. So this whole, there was a whole sort of body of feeling that the way that the black soldiers were treated weren't fair. It wasn't cricket. It wasn't right. And there was a sort of a resistance to it in this country quite low level and sometimes so there were signs outside pubs certainly in Bristol saying this pub is reserved for English men and black soldiers um, it was also you know in the stories that actually bus conductresses have called and told me that they would evict uh, white GIs on their buses who were trying to get rid of black soldiers saying you don't do this in this country you get off if you've got a problem they'll stay um, there were letters to the Foreign Office. There was one very powerful letter from a father who'd gone to a dance in Essex with his two daughters and his wife. And everything had kicked off when one of the six black soldiers at this dance had dared to ask a white woman to dance. He was immediately surrounded by six white GIs who beat him up. The officer then got involved and then evicted the black soldier. And then the British people objected to that. The girls refused to dance with the white GIs. They cancelled the dance. It was all very tense. This was sort of a classic, this, this tension. And then it got more violent. So in the summer before the uprising in Launceston, um, in Bamber Bridge, there was a shooting. A British civilian died. And yet the British people and the servicemen, the civilians and the servicemen drinking in the pub where everything kicked off again because of over enthusiastic military policing. Uh, they lay the blame very squarely at the, at the hands of the white MPs. In Corsham, chocolate box, lovely Corsham in Wiltshire, to give you a sense of the breadth of where this was happening, there was near insurrection on the streets. Um, again, MPs, policing, rounding up black soldiers. And you have this wonderful report in the National Archives where the um, commander of the Southern Commission, um, Commission, Harry Haig, is saying, you know, you could hear these British voice saying, that's not democracy, that's not fair, they're as good as you. And it's all kind of simmering. And it got to a point where a black sergeant turned around and said we ain't no slaves this is England so this is the very feverish background to the insurrection in Launceston and then there were two events that happened just days before that really brought everything into touch the first occasion was Leary Constantine the cricketer who had come down to London with his family to play a friendly game to raise funds for the troops and he had booked in to the Imperial Hotel in Bloomsbury and was promptly ejected because the American servicemen there objected to him being there. Um, after that, just a few days later, Amelia King, a young black British woman, was rejected from the Women's Land Army on the basis of her colour. So there was a huge outcry over both these cases that happened within days of each other and within days of the shooting. It happened in Parliament, in newspapers, and it kind of exploded in this volcanic pole for mass observation on the streets of London that found that 75% of British people had a definite, definite disapproval of the colour bar. And this is the background to the Launceston mutiny. And it's against this groundswell of support for African-American soldiers. So what happened to my soldiers? They arrive in Launceston. Their very first meeting, they're called to the commander. And he says, look, whatever happens, you can't go into town. You are restricted to camp. This was the third camp they've been at. It is the third camp they're restricted. And the reason was they didn't have the correct dress shirts. It didn't stop the white soldiers going to town, but just them. And they thought, no, we're going to go into town because I think they sensed that they were welcome there by the townspeople. Um, so on the Saturday night, they went into town. There was a dance. Five soldiers were evicted from the dance, five black soldiers. Again, there were British civilians and servicemen around saying that's not fair. But it kind of set the tempo for what was going on. The next night on the Sunday night, a group of them went into town and they're doing a pub crawl where they were tasting gin drops and British beer. Um, and each pub they went to, the white GIs who were in would make sort of 
these kind of gestures at them telling to get out. Um, and each time, very interestingly, a British group would stand at the bar and buy them drinks. So there's this kind of tension. There was some fight in a pub and one of the soldiers came outside and said, will we stick together? Let's do something. And that precipitated the armed uprising in Launceston. There was huge coverage of this story. And I can still remember the sense of disbelief when a story that my dad had told me, the rough details of, kind of unfolded in front of my very eyes in the British Library, because literally every newspaper carried this story. It was front page news and it was a big, big deal, particularly because there was a trial at Paynton Police Station. Paynton because it was the only police station big enough to hold such a large group of soldiers. There were 14 who were charged, two sergeants and 12 privates. So it was a big, big deal. Um, and for me, the very interesting thing about this story, you've got the shooting and then you have the second, the subsequent story of the trial. And that's a story in its own right. I don't want to ruin and preempt you reading the book, but it was a kind of a masterclass in a kangaroo court. There were so many things wrong with this trial. None of the white soldiers there could identify any of the defendants. 12 of the 14 statements weren't sworn properly, so they should have been thrown out anyway. Um, the investigators couldn't identify anyone they're meant to have interrogated. They went in, there's a lovely view of how interrogations went on. The interrogators went into a room with a list of names and they asked whoever was involved and then just wrote down the list that they'd already come in with. It was a real howler of a trial. Um, and there were real signs here that the army authorities were very frightened by this because twice they tried to censor this trial. Right at the beginning, they said the president, within minutes of the opening, said, well, this is the trial. You have to run everything through the census board, but you can't report race. And a very plucky Daily Mirror journalist stood up and said, well, that's been the public domain. We've reported that. So the fact that we know about this is only because of the Daily Mirror reporter's intervention. And then the last intervention by the judge to make sure that this didn't really go anywhere was on the third day after deliberating for 10 hours, the judge came back and said, well, we have reached a verdict, but that verdict is going to be private. So for me, the saddest part of this tale, and I'll just show you the soldiers here. Here they are coming out of court on the very last day and they didn't know what the verdict was. And I don't think I'll be ruining it too much for you to say that they were found guilty. Um, so this was what happened in Launceston. There were attempts, as I said, at a cover up. Um, why? Why was this such a big deal? Again, I think there are two reasons. Firstly, they were embarrassed and frightened by the racial tension. This was an element of the trial that was cut out. I've seen two reports compiled by investigators immediately after this um, insurrection and race was at the heart of this uprising. Two of the soldiers that day said we knew it was going to happen that night. It was so tense you could cut the atmosphere with a knife. Two publicans serving that day said it was frightening. One shut up shop earlier. One of the defendants himself said he took a bayonet with him everywhere because he was so frightened he knew he'd be picked off. He was found alone by a group of white soldiers. He would be hurt. So they were embarrassed. That's why I wanted to censure it. But the second thing that I think is even more important, they didn't want the strain in Anglo-American relationships to be on public display. There is no doubt in my mind that there was heavy British involvement in this mutiny. Two of the sergeants under fire that night commented on how the British were always around, the British servicemen, there was a group of Royal Engineers who were drinking with the black soldiers that night. Um, they thought initially that this was a confrontation of British soldiers against the Americans. They didn't realise they were African-American until right at the end. So there was this whole strain in Anglo-American relations caused by segregation, what the British called the colour bar, which came between the two. And it's a window in history in 1943 where you could really see the grey areas in Anglo-American relations. And it's certainly very different to what I grew up thinking about the home front in the Second World War. 
So I really hope you've enjoyed this and I've given you a flavour of what the book's about and I'm really looking forward to hearing your questions. Thank you very much. I, I realised this afternoon, I'll be honest with you here, I was, I was going to sh show you people your book and I realised I've lent it to somebody else and I, <laughs> I haven't got it back. <laughs> so I haven't got a copy to hold up. But the book is called? It's An American Uprising in Second World War England, Mutiny in the Duchy. The Duchy being the Duchy of Cornwall. There you are, An American Mutiny. Yeah. And, and you can find it on all well-known book, uh, well bookstores and on various other uh, sites where you can buy books. Um, uh, Anne Braithwaite, it's really most provoking. I'd love to share this with my American family. How can I access the recording after? You can access it through the Toll Puddle Radical History uh, page. If you just go to Toll Puddle Martyrs, you'll be able to access it uh, through the Toll Puddle Radical History page and it'll be there for some time. And, um, I, I, what was interesting when I read this book was uh, the, 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 com the complete background that these guys had had. They'd had a very, very hard time, hadn't they? Uh, not only in America, but also traveling to Britain. And then when they got to the camp here, things still weren't right for them. Uh, and they were uh, they were just segregated in the way that you've described. But actually, conditions for them were worse than they were for the white troops who were just in another camp a mile up the road. Really. No, it's ter it was terrible, actually. I mean, even they weren't allowed when um, at the end of the war, when the troops were demobbed and they're brought home, that if you look at the American troops returning, there are no black soldiers on those ships. That's because they were they were kept below until the white and then the parades. They weren't allowed to parade. It is so sad. And um, with these guys in Launceston, you can feel their anger and you can feel their resentment building through the court martial. And for me, the really sad thing is very few of them actually got to speak. They didn't speak. And then if you look at the, the way that the case was brought together and the way that it was investigated, you kind of understand why and why they didn't trust that you know the, the fact that they'd get a fair trial they didn't have a fair trial it's obvious and i think you no, can read that yeah your account of the trial is very very good and and it certainly came across to me it was certainly an extremely unfair and biased trial i, I don't want to spoil the book for people in, in any way as you said earlier uh but this is a story i've uh, been uh, i've grown up within the last 43 years i've been living in Norton. Uh, Jacqueline wants to know, were you able to interview residents of Lawson who were alive at the time and to get their stories? Well, do you know what? Lucky enough, I was. Do you know Joan Rendell? Do you know the name Joan Rendell? I did know Joan Rendell. She died five, six years ago. I knew yeah. Joan, yeah. Yeah, she was, so she was a local historian. But at the time, and she's, she's in the book, she was a young 21 or two-year-old, um, and she was a witness to what went on. Um, and she was, you know, she gave me a good, broad, background to what it was like when the Americans arrived anyway so yeah I spoke to her I spoke to at the museum they've got um some recording they've got some records of people who remembered it um Arthur and then Wills. I went that's right the legendary Arthur Wills um and there's some other people um who were just able to point me in the right direction so yeah I was able to and I've got the most fantastic recording of a woman who was a young girl at the time and they were living around the corner from the square, they could hear it and they had a, like this window into it and then had to keep that from the window because they were worried they're going to get shot. So, I mean, it was a very dramatic um, firefight. And certainly, Les, when my dad moved back to Cornwall, when they went to Launceston, he just said it was that everyone was still talking about it. I think perhaps because they didn't know what happened to the soldiers at the end because it was just there was a, a, a curtain came down. On what they, happened, really? Am I right? They all went to Leavenworth, didn't they? They were sent to American jails. They weren't they even went kept back, in yeah. jails in Germany. No. Yeah, they were all sent yeah. back to America. Yeah. yeah. All shipped um, back. I, I, I chatted to a guy called Aubrey Gregory, who'd been sat out by his mother to get fish and chips. And uh, he was on his way back with the fish and chips when this started. And he dived to the ground with the fish and chips underneath him oh. and was delayed <laughs> getting home. And when he got home, which is basically mm. just around the corner, about 500 yards away, his mother said, oh, you've been a long time getting the fish and chips. He said, well, it's just been shooting in the square. And she clipped him around the ear because he thought he was lying <laughs> and the fish and chips were flattened. So there you go. <laughs> there, are, there are these stories. And, uh, and when I came, you could still see bullet holes in buildings yeah. in Hicks, in Hicks's uh, yeah. millinery shop and the White Hart and, and the... Um, the war memorial those bullet holes have now unfortunately all been filled in mainly been filled in and eradicated yeah. but it is it is an incredibly interesting so do you know of any other events like this in the uk uh where oh, well, armed yeah 
Yeah, there was there was loads. I mean, actually, the more you look at it, the more it was going on. They tried desperately to hush it all up. Um, but there was a report after in the three months. I mean, make no mistake that the authorities were very worried about this tension um, in the morale reports. They were constantly monitoring the soldiers morale. And one of the reports just before D-Day was like, if the invasion doesn't happen soon, trouble's going to happen in the UK because it was kicking off. Yeah, Bamber Bridge is one of the cases I've mentioned. There were, um, I can't remember off the top of my head, nearly 60 in the three months that were reported three months after launch, it kept going on. And um, throughout, wherever the, the troops were stationed, when there were black troops and white troops, there would be trouble. And I think really, as Mary Lou said, the trouble was, it, it was they didn't like the way that the British were treating the black soldiers. And, and it came down to that. And it was, they felt they shouldn't be allowed to go out and do the same thing and have the same opportunities. And, and it, it kicked off and then, you get a very British reaction, I think, just saying, well, it's not fair. That's not fair. That's always our cry, isn't it? That's not fair. And, and, and so it was going on wherever, but there was a real um, effort to keep this subdued. And actually, you've got to say, we had a fantastic press at the time, the Daily Mirror, Daily Herald. Um, they kept it right at the forefront and a great danger to themselves, actually. And they came under a lot of flack for doing it. But they reported this. And as I said in my, my talk, the only reason we know about Launceston is because the Daily Mirror said, you know, the black troops involved. But they tried to, they took the colour out of any report that went up. I will get this out before we end. And, and, and I would recommend everyone to read uh, A Small Island by Andrea Levy as well, yeah. which is a, yeah. a fantastic yeah. book about uh, the yeah. West Indian uh, black experience in, in, uh, in Great Britain in the Second World War. But what interested me a lot as well was that uh, a lot of white people in Cornwall uh, couldn't tolerate the arrogance of the white soldiers, the, the, the arrogance and the ignorance of the white soldiers, as you said, uh, who literally came here and started to complain about things. Everything was too slow. There weren't fridges. There weren't this. There weren't that. And the black soldiers were much more friendly. Would that be fair, do you think? They were much yeah. more... We accept the life as it is here, you know, it's better than it was in Southern America, probably. Yeah, well, this is what Walter White actually, so he was the president, the, the guy from the NAACP, and he felt because the black soldiers were stationed mostly in rural areas, and they were mostly from rural areas, um, he felt there was a synergy, you know, there was no, um, I don't know, there was looking through, the thing that I found quite upsetting, actually, reading the reports, I've been of a generation growing up thinking with a certain view of the Second World War and the home front and this great, you know, everyone working together. Um, and they were very, I mean, especially their views towards women were very misogynistic. You read well, through what yeah. they felt about British women and what they could do to them. And that was their, what was owed them. You know, they treated them like prostitutes, you know, a lot of very nasty sort of undercurrents that you just you wouldn't be aware that they were there and I think they weren't treated like that on the whole by the black soldiers and all these reports you know mass observations this great sort of chronicler of what people were thinking you know they said you know even the prostitutes like the black soldiers more because they treated them like people you know they treated them with respect and it is interesting and I'm sure you know it is only one side of the story but it's part of the bigger picture it's really interesting as I said it's a shade isn't it it's a colouring of, of grey you know that we maybe didn't know before. No I think you're absolutely right I, I see that Marigold's put up about you know the story of African-American GIs in Dorset it was written in 2013 by Louisa Adua Parker which is well worth a read yeah and I'll it's look at that. Dorset multicultural it's in the chat if you want to write it down if you just bring yeah. the chat up you'll see it yeah. there. Well, uh, well it falls to me. It falls to me to thank you for for doing this for us. Um, I can't tell you how excited I was to have something actually based in the town where I live, oh, uh, yeah. which which yeah. had which had true historic importance mm. uh, and was uh, in many ways, as as Mary Louise said, a, a geopolitical moment. Um, and I think uh, the the two of you together tonight have given us a great picture of what life was like uh, for Black GIs in England. Uh, during the Second World War. I thank you for that. I hope we've uh, got people thinking. I'm sure we have. I look forward to, to meeting you sometime in Lawson as we've discussed when you're down and we'll have a chat about uh, all sorts of things, I hope. And uh, once again, my grateful thanks for you to doing it. And I'm going to uh, close this now. So thank you everyone for attending. The next one next month will be about the Toll Battle Martyrs Settlers in Canada. And uh, we've got a gentleman whose name has slipped my mind. Nigel, can you remind me what the man's called? Uh, Jeff Anderson. Jeff Anderson. He's uh, joining us from Canada. 
he's actually joining us from Canada. So it's another uh, another multinational uh, show from the Tol Paddle Radical History School. Uh, and we look forward to that as well. So thank you once again, Kate. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank, thank you. you. Thank Nigel you. And, and uh, hopefully we'll see you all next month. Thank you very much. Goodbye. <laughs>